You're listening to Building the Future, a podcast by Cadence Science Partner. And my name is Rudy van Beurden. In this podcast, I meet innovators, trailblazers, and bright minds who are busy building the future. In 20 years time, we will not eat meat anymore. In this episode, we will focus on this teasing thesis together with three inspiring guests who know everything about what we'll be eating in the future. And we've picked an appropriate location for this very session, the Wageningen campus in the Netherlands, the heart of the food valley. In this location, many people and organizations work on healthy and sustainable food production and nutrition. Here with me, three guests, and we'll start obviously with the woman directly across of me, Ingrid van der Meer, you're attached here at the Wageningen University as a manager of the business units on biosciences and you work on duckweed. Yeah. Welcome. Next to you, Mark Arts, CEO of Green Food 50, um, a rapidly growing company, also working here at the campus in Wageningen. And right next to me, Matteo Piano, founding partner together with your wife from Inogusto. A very warm, warm welcome to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. How are you feeling, Matteo, to be here at the campus? Quite relaxed. Yeah. Yes, yes. I'm, f- I'm feeling actually we um, trans- uh, we came here a few weeks ago. And I would say that feels for me quite different than working from uh, where we worked. So the ecosystem uh, we like very much. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. And I already mentioned actually the statement we want to kick off this very episode with. And it says, in 20 years time, we will not eat meat anymore. Matteo, what do you think? Do you agree or disagree? I disagree. You disagree. And what about Ingrid? I also disagree. Yeah. All right, Mark. Yeah, for me the same. I also disagree. All of you disagree with this very statement. So it's it's maybe not too controversial yet, but maybe we can find something for that and maybe we can bring some nuance to the table from your various perspectives. That would be very nice. Because why is it so needed that we have to lessen the meat consumption? Ingrid, maybe if we start with you, because you actually have been personally a vegetarian for like 30 years already, isn't it? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so what we at Wageningen University and Research are aiming for is what we call the protein transition. That's also from uh, from our government a uh, very uh, important incentive. We will want to shift to a diet which is for 40% based on um, animal-based uh, products and for 60% plant-based products. And what you see at this time is that it's the other way around. So we're eating a lot of... Um, animal-based products and we should shift to more plant-based products and why because I think it's um, it's more healthy for you to eat more plant-based products it's better for our, our environment and um, in this way we will be able to feed the growing world population mm-hmm. and this is something that you do actually personally already for so many years but maybe to nuance the statement a little bit further is it actually feasible to eat no or less meat at all in the upcoming 20 years for the dutch population as a whole well the the aim is to eat less meat but to eat no meat i even think that's not correct it's not good so we do need animals in a, a circular production system a sustainable circular production system and there are some elements from animals that indeed are much easier to get them from uh, animal products than from uh, plant products. So I don't think we should be a veganist, Um, so we still need animals, but we should reduce it compared to what we're eating now. So you're actually saying we should always need animals, why is that? So you do need animals to eat, let's say, the plants that we cannot eat, like grass or the leaves or stems from the tomato plants, of which we eat tomatoes. So there's also a rest stream of the production of plants that can be eaten by animals. And animals are needed, for instance, for more things than just the meat. So it's also um, other products from the animals, but also the manure, uh, the skin, the bones, etc. So you really think you need it in a circular and sustainable production 
plant uh, food production system. All right, let's dive in that a little bit later on because you also research on various other alternatives, duckweed in, in specific. Mm-hmm. Um, but first, let us move on to your neighbor, Marek, CEO of Green Food. You're sitting here more from a company's perspective. Maybe in a nutshell, what is it what Green Food 50 is providing? Yeah, what we provide is uh, quinoa. Uh, that's the pronunciation from Latin America or quinoa, uh, because now we grow it in the Netherlands. And what we uh, provide is that uh, we are able with the varieties developed by Wageningen to grow the quinoa here in, uh, yeah, for example, here in Gelderland, but also many of the other provinces. And from that, we, uh, in a mild way, we are able to transform it into an ingredient. And f- with that ingredient, you can make delicious products. So, for example, plant-based products like burgers, bowls, but also bakery products, but even sports nutrition. And uh, yeah, we are also proud. We are also a supplier for the baby food industry. So you see a lot of opportunities with this uh, quinoa crop. A growing sector. Yes, for sure. We see a fast uh, movement there. And also because we see now uh, the product is now more and more consumed from local origin. Uh, In the past, it came traditionally from Latin America. But now people see that it is possible to grow it here. We see especially now in this time with Corona, where there's a lot of interest in buying local. So we see this movement clearly and that helps to uh, also to grow this. So that's why we're also optimistic that we can do much more plant-based in the near future. And for you personally, what made you step into the field of quinoa in the first place? Yeah, nice that you say field, because um, indeed I I came from more the traditional industry, providing ingredients, but Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the dream was to, yeah, from a field, eh, directly from a field, from a crop, uh, divert that uh, into ingredients with keeping the maximum of the nutrients, uh, but also doing it in a very sustainable way. And yeah, we started uh, seven years ago, then this was yeah, really new. And now we are yeah, spot on in this whole trend towards more mal- uh, mild processing, but also plant-based, uh, mm-hmm. taking it just from a crop instead from an animal uh, source. Yeah, so just before with Ingrid, we were softening up the statement already, like, uh, should we eat no meat at all in the upcoming 20 years, you were disagreeing yourself as well. But maybe if it's, is it feasible to eat no or less meat in the upcoming 20 years? I, I think I suppose I know what the answer is already, but maybe yeah, just no, hearing yeah, it less, from you. Uh, less definitely and uh, and good in, in a way I'm optimistic because you see developments going fast. Eh? You have three uh, challenges, that's uh, taste. So yeah, you see everyone is working on it also for other crops on improving the taste. The second one is convenience, uh, easy to get now. You see, you can order everywhere now, online boxes, you can get products to your home. Uh, But we see also our distribution is also increasing. And the third one is uh, cost. Uh, It it is not only for the happy few in Amsterdam, but it should be available to to everyone. And that you see also progress is now made. Uh, Although that that's of course, everything is step by step, but every year we see also that yields improve. And that means that and volumes increase. And that means that yeah, the products become more and more affordable. Mm -hmm. So with the development of all these alternatives, you have to keep in mind these three requirements, at least. Those are crucial, uh, all challenging. And I think most challenging is uh, is taste. Yeah. But okay, I think the third speaker can tell much more about that. Yeah. But anyway, uh, yeah, that's still very challenging. But therefore, we are happy to be here at the campus in Wageningen, because here you have all the knowledge. How, yeah, how can you, in fact, transform these uh, crops into also tasteful uh, products? So, yeah. So, we should decrease our meat consumption in the upcoming 20 years. If you could make a guesstimate, like some Americans say, how many percent of the, the meat we could be cutting over the upcoming 20 years? Uh, yeah, good there, uh, because it's not, not me, but there are so many um, uh, companies who do investigations. Mm-hmm. And they estimate between 10 and 20 percent, so increase in plant uh, protein, in fact, being a share of this uh, huge, uh, that we should not forget, it's huge, this meat market. Uh, and, and then I'm more on the optimist side, so on the 20% uh, side. We are now, uh, for example, there was just recently a publication in Netherlands, we are at 2.5%. But okay, we learned now also in these times of Corona about exponential growth. So that's why I'm optimist uh, that, okay, from this 2.5%, uh, 
uh, when you go and grow every year, there was 50% uh, grow in two years. So when you extrapolate that, yeah, then in 20 years, I think we can add. So to uh, clarify, 20%. only two and a half percent of the current consumption is is based on alternative. Yes, besides in the Netherlands, and the Netherlands is on top even in in Europe. If okay. you uh, look to the share of the market, but it's not the biggest market because the German, the Spanish and the UK market are bigger. So for you as a business leader, that's a huge bus business potential. Yes, that's uh, but uh, uh, yeah, we need many, many companies to get involved yeah. to uh, because 20% is an incredible amount of plant based. So and when we all want to grow that locally, then it's a huge step forward. Uh, Definitely. Well, that's a very nice bridge and we're sitting actually on the bridge connecting two of the buildings here at the Wageningen uh, campus to Matteo, also a business owner, together with your wife, you founded in Augusto. Um, first, it's actually the one question I had on my way towards Wageningen today. How is it to run a company with your wife? It's great. No, you know, um, in Augusto started from us. My wife is vegetarian, uh, I'm not, I'm more flexitarian now. And uh, you know, at a certain point we want to do things together. And uh, me and my wife, we do most of the things together, why not doing business together? So for us it was like a natural step to take. And But we, uh, of course, we had a background, my wife had a background, I had a background, uh, business-wise, how we bring it together. And so we, we brought our experience and, and know-how together and it, with something we have passion for, good food. And certainly I'm Italian, so there's no compromise on good food. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, but for us it was a natural step and I have to say, yeah, we, we approach it also professionally and uh, we are both passionate about what you're doing, mm -hmm. yeah. And it's maybe good to say, uh, coming from your background, because you're not actually uh, a scientist on, on the food, but you're more or less building brands, isn't it? Yes. That's your passion. My passion and my background for many years has been building brands. And for us, well, uh, through the years I developed even a, a proper m a methodology, but for us really, and which we have taken within in Augusto, is that we start with the customer experience. That's really where we start with. So we don't look uh, first at, because if the customer experience is not there, uh, you have to convince, you have, it gets complicated and you're losing the customer. So we believe that uh, if you start with a customer experience and you take it from there, then design the product, then find the ingredients, the producers, all the partners, and you work in an interdisciplinary way with all the partners, you can do it. However, that's quite a challenge. Mm -hmm. So what did you discover? What is it what customers need most? Well, customers, they, in fact, what customers want is something, uh, customers are difficult to change habits, okay? So they like something which is familiar. However, uh, what is familiar? Uh, because in the north of the Netherlands is not the same as the south of the Netherlands and the east and the west. So what they want is something familiar, but they want, uh, it for, as from a branding point of view, it's very simple. They want gratification. So it's a rather emotional than rational. If the emotional is not there, the rational doesn't count. The rational will play somewhere. You know, the rational approach with food is when you have to perform, you look at food rationally, or you're sick. Okay, you're ill. Then you look at, the, but if you want to eat and enjoy food, you look at it from an emotional point of view. Mm -hmm. So what they want is gratification. If you can give them gratification, and on top of that, the rational benefits, the social benefits, then you're winning. And that's quite a challenge. But actually, I guess you found uh, throwing dinner parties to get at your wife as well, that some friends sometimes did not even realize no. that they weren't eating meat no, while it was looking like it. That's how it started. We started experimenting with our friends. We presented them an Italian uh, dish. We didn't tell anything. And at the end, we asked them, Did, didn't you notice anything special? Of course, such a question already <laughs> starts to <laughs> ring what bells did you like, do? okay, what is it? Are we eating bugs or what is it? No, so it was not meat and nobody actually even uh, noticed that they were not eating meat. So for us, it was like, it is possible to gratify a person, uh, let's say uh, sensorially, uh, uh, organically, uh, organoleptically, sorry, 
uh, and still meeting the, the requirements that you have to meet. So we presented something which had no meat, but they, they, they were not noticed. So mm -hmm. Actually, we did another experiment in Germany. People who w knew that there was not meat, and they say, no, 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 I'm not going to eat it. And they were already resisting it. And then we say, well, try, and then tell us. And after trying, they say, hmm, okay. Then in fact, so I think there is a resistance towards like uh, uh, plant-based food. Uh, and especially with the label vegan, people say vegan, then okay, then it's uh, less uh, health, uh, less uh, uh, tasty. No, it's not. So that's the focus we are focusing on. And does it depend on the culture of the country? Are Dutch people more open-minded to try new things uh, compared to Germans? Uh, yes, Germans are quite traditional. They are meat lovers. Okay, Same Don't as Italians, touch. isn't it? Uh, well, Italians eat, uh, eat less meat. Less yes, Germans. less than Germans. Italians are not really meat eaters. They are more uh, by nature. They eating much more uh, uh, greens and etc. So much more carbohydrates, but also much more vegetables. So Italians are less, and also they eat their meat pure without any uh, sauce on it. <laughs> Just a drizzle of olive oil. That's it. That's so awesome. very. The culture is totally different. While in Germany, they eat a lot of more of processed meat. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Before we dive in that, maybe to conclude this very introduction, because the statement says we should eat no meat at all, or at least less meat in 20 years time. Uh, to conclude with you, Matteo, why do you think personally we should downscale? You, you've become a flexitarian as well, not really a vegetarian yet, but every now and then you eat meat, but more consciously maybe. I think that for me, two reasons, and I think for most people, two reasons. One is the we cannot continue like you know the logic tells us you cannot continue this you know there's like why it requires mass production so we look at animals as as just uh, an ingredient or or a raw material okay but that, that's one thing so we cannot continue like this it's very simple but then the second part which i see is the way we approach the animal food production is 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 actually difficult from an ethical point of view okay we are starting to see it just as a raw material so the relationship with nature uh, is is really hampered is really challenged and if we see animals how they suffer to provide us food now many people they argue they say you know you well if, i'm not a veganist in ideology so i'm not saying animals suffer while they live not when they die because uh, when you kill them, it's the end of the suffering, not the beginning of it. But my problem is the suffering while they live. So I don't have a problem with eating animal food if it's done the proper way and mm -hmm. sustainably. But I have a problem, and I think many people have a problem, uh, when they see the suffering of animals. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, in, in the preparation for this very conversation, I saw that the Americans actually, they prioritize health you know, that's the reason why they want to eat less meat. But in the UK, for example, and in Western Europe as well, the animal suffering, and you tell it like when they are alive, is actually one of the reasons to cut down on meat consumption. And another small fact, like it's not a small fact at all. We've got like 70 billion animals for the meat consumption. That's 10 animals per world citizen. I was just mind blown when I read about this. Um, and if you want to interact with each other, please feel free. Uh, Ingrid, what do you think is going well right now on the, in, within the field of research? What are the big, biggest leaps we've been taking in the last five or 10 or 15 years? What's going well? Yeah, so I think the <clears throat> focus on more plant-based products, um, that's something that's ongoing. <clears throat> so where a lot of uh, breeding has been performed, for instance, uh, for quinoa. Um, but also for other plant protein crops that are not really well known yet. So this is an important part, uh, the search for new plant, uh, plant-based proteins or, or new crops, that's an uh, important uh, leap, I would say. Um, there are also very nice products produced at this moment, much better than 10 years ago. So the things that you can find in the supermarket are, are yeah, there's much more variety, better tasting. So the... Um, I think these are really nice steps. We're also looking at, uh, for instance, insects. So it's not only plants that, of course, uh, deliver proteins, but there are more sources than 
the, the let's say, the, the farm am animals that we know now. So there are really quite some steps made. What I think is that the behavior of, of, of consumers, that's a difficult one to mm. tackle. So how do you really change that people in the Western world, we are now eating what I just mentioned, 60% of our diet is, is animal-based and only 40% plant-based, and how to make this shift again. And I think changing the behavior, and of course you need to have nice products that are tasty and challenging uh, enough um, and that people can, can use, but really to change the behavior, I think that's a difficult one. Mm -hmm. And yeah, maybe you have to go for uh, severe actions like making um, meat more expensive. Yeah, that it really becomes a luxury item, a yes. luxury product. Yeah, and and I think what's also important to have a large a large variety of of plants or of crops that we can eat, because mm -hmm. there are uh, six thousand plants that could be used as a crop, but we are actually for uh, more than sixty percent of the the crops that we are using now. It's it's only nine crops. So we're really focusing worldwide on a few crops for our plant-based uh, products, mm -hmm. while there are so many more that we could use. Is this also one of the reasons that you actually work very specifically with duckweed? Yeah, I <coughs> stumbled upon duckweed uh, within another uh, research project. And what I learned from uh, that project is that uh, duckweed can grow really very fast, much faster than any other plant. And it has on dry weight a high protein level. And the combination of this um, yeah, ensures that you can produce much more protein per hectare compared to soybean, for instance. And knowing that we have this challenge that there will not be enough plant protein to feed the world if we continue like we're doing now, because we're using the plant proteins also to feed our animals for a large part, I knew that, uh, uh, that we need to go for, for other sources of, of plant proteins. And I think uh, duckweed or water lentils, it's another, an ancient name, is a, a very good uh, opportunity. Yeah, yeah. And to all of you, and please uh, take up the question whenever you want. So obviously behavior, that's one aspect. Maybe we can use the stick or the carrots in order to move consumers or very well-talented uh, brand I, experts. I, I'd rather see it, for me it's too rational uh, because it's not a matter of protein. When I go to the store and I'm not looking for protein, I'm looking for something uh, to eat. Me, I, I rather want to speak not of a protein transition, but more a meat transition. Because of course there is already protein, uh, vegetable protein on the market and beans and everything. So there's an offer. Mm -hmm. The problem right now or the challenge is how to replace meat from uh, animal to uh, plant-based meat. And I think there is the great challenge. And when I see, and the challenges that we meet is sometimes is to replace one ingredient like meat, we need 20 other ingredients to replace it. It's not creating confidence towards the customer. They're saying, okay, what's in it? So that's a big challenge. We replace one ingredient with 20 others. And that's not really uh, giving confidence. And uh, I think we have to look at from more, how can we, uh, it's not that the customer has a problem with, with a good product because at the end he likes it or he doesn't like it. You cannot force it. It's, there are no children, you know, you say you have to eat your vegetables. But at the end is how can we create something that really is attractive? And I think we have still a long way to go. Mm -hmm. Can you name an example of something that is attractive, a very good alternative? Uh, I have, well, uh, ingredients, uh, products that I say we have, uh, I'm not going to make any uh, uh, Advertisement. Uh, advertising, <laughs> but there's some, there's one or two hamburgers which I, I like, which we say, okay, the way you bake it, the way you cook it, the result is fine. Uh, so there's a couple of products we, we like and we buy and we say, okay, this is good. So uh, we have no problems because at the end we are not producing uh, the ingredient, we are producing the final uh, product. So there are a couple of products uh, that in terms of bite, we also are now using an ingredient that to replace bacon, okay, which is also another challenge. Uh, but we appreciate some of the techniques they're using is not really chemical techniques or ingredients, but some mechanical techniques that are being using to create structure. 
And that's really what we're looking for, to create a structure that is not the result of chemical uh, uh, process, but more a mechanical process. Mm -hmm. And I think there is the future to develop machines and, uh, and, and uh, tools that can create the structure with simple ingredients. Yeah. And that's, that's really... Yeah, I fully uh, agree uh, because yeah, it's all about taste, but also getting to what's called clean label. Uh, because what you now see, uh, the first generation is more, yeah, make it look like meat and use whatever you can find chemically and whatever. Uh, and uh, what you now see, the next step is to make it clean label, simple amount of ingredients. And uh, yeah, what was just mentioned is texturing. So for example, we are now doing a lot uh, of work on texturing so that you get, in fact, by creating in a mechanical way a texture, you get uh, a juiciness, but also certain properties. And then still being able, because then you don't need all these chemicals. Uh, so uh, then in a natural way with five or, or seven ingredients, yeah, you can also make a tasty product. Yeah. But okay, the point there is the simpler you want to make it, the more complex it is. But okay, then again, uh, then uh, Wageningen is then of course a very good location because yeah, all this knowledge to make products simpler is available here. But okay, you have of course then to turn it into practice. And yeah, that, that is where we focus on, on on this moment. Yeah, and, and this, yeah, in no, I think ahead. we should not only focus on meat replacers. So to have a plant-based product that looks like meat or a burger or whatever, but also it would be nice if the consumer changes his, uh, his diet into uh, yeah, meals in which there's no meat or no meat replacer, just based on vegetables. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree. Entirely. So, entirely. Yeah. So actually designing meals which are attractive. Yeah. 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 So that's something that's upcoming right now. Uh, Matteo, Mark earlier on mentioned three requirements, the taste, the convenience and the variation. Is this something you agree with? And are these the right requirements in order to... I agree with uh, maybe the interpretation different. I would say taste, uh, we say uh, gr uh, customer gratification, mm -hmm. which is more complex than just taste, is organoleptic. Means uh, color, uh, uh, smell, uh, flavor, texture, all that. All Secondly, sentences. convenience, we say, uh, we call it uh, about uh, accessibility. So that means also how you use it. Where can I find it? What is the price? Uh, so the, your price for me is accessibility, but also is a product easy to use? That's also accessibility. And with a third point, we uh, we adopt in our strategy is uh, variation. Can you have enough variation? Because if I always have to eat the same product, and that's one thing of the challenges right now is that the variation in the uh, proposition of uh, products right now is too limited. There should be much more variation. Also, we sh there's one thing, and also the the possibilities which I, the kind of meals I can make with one product should be more than just baking it because it's too much oil based right now, baking it in the pan. So we have to do, be able to do more with it. So versatility of the product and variation is the third point that we actually are adopting. Mm -hmm. So partially I'm agreeing, but that third, po third point, otherwise people get bored. And you know, say, yeah, I'm eating, but I'm not replacing and say, I still need something else. Yeah. So that variation is for us a, a, a interesting point, but also a big challenge, a big challenge really, because uh, it's not like you can use the same ingredient for many meals uh, with, with plant-based meat, if I can call it like that. They have been created for very specific application for very specific use. So when you want to create something else, maybe it doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. So we're sitting around this table with various perspectives from various organizations. Um, some is going well already, like we're taking steps forward. But still, what is needed to be done, or in more specific terms, what are you going to do in the upcoming five years? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, good. I think at uh, this diversification, so different sources, and uh, but yeah, in fact, if you look back, uh, because like soy uh, is already there for hundred years, so. In fact, seven years ago, we started just from scratch. I think the good news is that you don't nowadays need 100 years to develop a portfolio. But still, uh, yeah, in these 100 years, they also did a lot of, of work. So, so you can now do it in a shorter time period. But 
okay, still means that also there will still be the ongoing challenge for the coming years uh, to make it an alternative and also working on affordability uh, because um, yeah, the, uh, by far the biggest ingredient used in plant-based is soy. So that means that yeah, it has the advantage, it has a very low price and it has a good uh, profile. Uh, but yeah, good. If you want to diversify, you need alternatives. But of, per definition, they start with smaller volumes, and then comes there the affordability. So that's where we focus on to, um, as mentioned before, not making it only available for the happy few, but making it more in general available. And uh, yeah, good. And that you see that's the other side. Uh, that's more than on the plant-based side on the variety. So that's why we cooperate with uh, also here Mageningen on developing, it's a five-year program now, developing new varieties which are more stable. You see every year the, 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 the circumstances are different. This year is totally different than last year. And also uh, yeah, making there a bigger uh, yield possible so that it becomes better affordable, this uh, product. And this is to be done in the upcoming five years, like yes. yeah, it takes, working yes. from a Model S towards yes. a Model 3 in Tesla speaking terms. Yeah, and uh, we get have other words, but we're working now, yeah, towards even hybrid versions in, uh, and and that's indeed a whole new S uh, cycle. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Ingrid, your upcoming five years. What are you reaching for? What are your goals? And maybe how can listeners, maybe professionals or consumers, help you with this? My personal goal or my personal research is focused on water lentils or duckweed, and. Um, so um, it is seen by the European Food Safety Authority as a novel food. So we needed to fill a dossier with uh, scientific evidence that, it, that you can produce it in a safe way, that it doesn't contain any contaminants or toxins or allergens, etc. And that, that consumers can indeed eat it and, and, and take up the uh, proteins. Is that a lengthy process? It's a very lengthy process yeah, and, and uh, expensive, I must say. But we were able to submit this dossier and waiting for the approval. And in the meantime, we're working on using water lentils together with the chefs in uh, nice dishes and um, to see how you can use it as a vegetable, but also extracting protein, proteins and see how you can use these proteins in, in products, in uh, meat replaces. So continuing uh, the research on water lentils, getting the whole chain together, so all the stakeholders within the chain. That's my personal goal. And within Wageningen University in Research, yeah, it's much broader, of course, on, on the protein transition. It's a very important investment theme. And also one part is um, where we try to see whether our, uh, the, the animals, the livestock that we have, whether we can feed them on less um, uh, let's say nice products than what they're eating now. Mm -hmm. So mostly it's soy, while soy can also be used for human consumption. Yeah. So we are also uh, yeah, looking whether you can feed the animals on rest streams that we have. So that's that's also one of the, the, the goals, let's yeah, say. Yeah. And maybe to, to make it very explicitly about duckweed, because the, the yield is very high, isn't it, on protein, but it's also very fast growing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so it grows very fast by, by splitting in two. Uh, so every two days you have a multiplication of the, the material. So it's something that you can t continuously can, can harvest and it has a high protein content on, on dry weight. So you really can produce a lot of protein or a, a lot of plants. And we are also focusing now on what we call vertical farming. So you grow it in layers indoors with LED light on top of it, oh, on, wow. on the layers. And then you really can produce an enormous amount of protein or vegetable yeah. per square meter. If only we could apply that very skill to regular hamburgers, then yeah. it would be so easy. Well, th that's also part of the research that we're doing. If they could duplicate like that, yes. Uh, the hamburgers at, as such, yeah. <laughs> By themselves, without needing more animals. That's just a joke. Uh, Matteo, Piano, your upcoming five years, how will well, they look? Well, we want to bring on the market more attractive products, and uh, we want to focus on really high standard culinary products. That's really our focus. We don't want to compete with uh, the hamburger, the sausage, we want to really see, you know, top uh, culinary products, which is quite a challenge. We cannot do this alone. We are really uh, even now collaborating with other partners. We believe very strongly in a complete value chain collaboration, interdisciplinary collaboration with different uh, parties. 
because to create an end product at the end, you really need the entire chain to work together. So that is really uh, important because we are not creating ingredients, we are the, the, the end product. So there are many challenges when I'm talking about the emotional side, you know, how long is your ingredient list, uh, how easy is it to make. So we want first to uh, deliver attractive products to make this shift uh, as seamless as possible. That's very important. So if we can succeed in proposing attractive products, high standard products, like we are working now on a, a vegan goose liver, uh, not because I'm a big fan of it, because I think symbolically, if you are able to make something like that, it, it covers two aspects. One, you convert some animal protein into a uh, plant-based protein, but also you are tackling the problem which I talked about, the suffering of animals. But if you can reach a certain level, then I think it, we hope to inspire other companies to really, uh, you know, uh, to say, okay, it's possible. We can make something attractive. Uh, customers will buy it. And uh, to attractive, not only in sense of taste, but also how to use it. Uh, convenience is a very uh, important aspect. Or convenience means also make it easy to cook. Not only easy to eat, but also easy to cook. Mm -hmm. So there are many challenges for us, but that's really what we want to focus on next year and, and working together with partners. Yeah, as a really. true trailblazer and really show what you're doing, your developments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. not necessarily the biggest market share, but maybe the, the most trending products on, on the market, okay? Because uh, I, I think we want to offer a product which is, has a value, okay? But I'm not against having a big market share. But what I think what is important is that we will be known, uh, hoping that we'll be known as people who, uh, as a company, who can bring food that even restaurant uh, chefs say, you know, I want to have it in my restaurant. Yeah, bring it on. That's it. Yeah, by Ino Gusto. Yeah, we have about uh, five minutes left. I don't know if there's someone of you having a question to one another. No, but maybe something to add, eh, because mm -hmm. I like what uh, you said about uh, working together in the local chain. Eh, and uh, yeah, and that's exactly what we also see, eh, because you build with all these partners. It's, it's all a matter about collaboration. Otherwise, it would also not be possible to do so many things in a short time period. But what we see also, and that's something um, yeah, we really would uh, like to encourage yeah, also consumers uh, please keep on buying local because by doing that you help this whole chain uh, from from the grower for uh, from the processor from the packer from it's a whole chain behind it and that uh, yeah by this buying local product so that's why also what we did is we um, uh, launched a special website called uh, nederlandsequinoa.nl mm -hmm. and there we explain the whole background but also there you can find our growers in the different provinces but also where you can buy the products so that you can help to yeah develop further this uh, chain and to uh, become and more conscious Yes, yeah. yes. And that will enable us then, together with these partners, to come yeah, at the end to better products uh, yeah, coming available and, and speeding up this transition. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Ingrid, one final shout out maybe by you. Is there something you want to mention? Yeah, I, I think um, behavioral change is very difficult. And mm. I hope that this podcast helps people to think about their diet and... Um, to, to understand that the shift to a uh, more plant-based diet really helps not only your health, but also the environment, but also help feeding the world. So, and, and of course the animal welfare. So there are really quite some incentives that might help people to make this change, just shift a little bit more to plant-based products. Yeah, and very hands-on initiatives already as well, like the week without meat or the month without meat. And I saw as well in the preparation that if people do so eating a week without meat, like nearly half of them said they actually are going to apply a sustainable change in their diet. So they did it for seven days or maybe 30 days. And then after all, they found out, well, I can tweak my own meat consumption a little bit as well. Yeah. So that could be a challenge for a very listener, a week without meat. Could you uh, handle, Matteo? I would like to challenge everybody in the business and in the market that is actually working in this protein shift to take it a notch higher. I think there's, this is my opinion, 
it's a bit too much, uh, it's good enough. Like, it, you know, it's nutritious, you can eat it. Uh, it's like, you know, and people have to get used to it. Uh, I think we should take it a, a much higher, a higher level, because I don't believe that uh, we should impose customers to, uh, to get on a course how to eat our products, but just, you know, understand them. And uh, we are working now with uh, different companies, but really, you know, we should take it a, a level higher. Yeah, that would be culinary level, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The culinary raising the bar. Well, that's yes. maybe something for we you as should. a true we trailblazer should. to say so to all of them. Um, I think it's time to wrap it up. We've been talking about should we eat less meat in 20 years time or will we eat no meat at all in 20 years time? All of you are quite realistic on that one. Well, we don't see that happening, but lessening the meat consumption is one thing for sure. We're working on that, even though it's still slowly, we will get there more and more surely. And um, I've heard many different aspects, like the behavior, the alternatives, making it even more culinary, that, that it's really on the emotion of people and you have to keep on telling your story like you do right now in this very episode on what you are working on. And I saw various people here at the table come from very various perspectives, but all working on this very massive big team. And that's uh, very nice to see. So, well, yeah, thank you very much for coming and joining. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So, you've listening to Building the Future, a podcast by Kadan Science Partner. And thanks to our guest, Mark. Arts from Green Food 50, Ingrid van der Meer from Wageningen University, and also Matteo Piano from Inagusto. This episode was recorded here at Wageningen Campus in the heart of the Food Valley. And right now, to be very more specific, we're sitting in the bridge, um, in bridging two buildings, the Plus Ultra buildings, buildings from Cadans Science Partner. Thank you. If you want to find out more about this podcast or our guest, go to cadans.com slash podcast. Here you'll also learn more about Cadans Science Partner and how it connects innovative organizations and ecosystems throughout Europe, helping them to work on sustainable solutions for the future. And do not forget to subscribe to this podcast in your favorite app so you won't miss our upcoming episodes. Thanks for listening and my name is Rudy van Beurden.